The Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation brings you Crime Photographer. Where are you going over Labor Day weekend, Tony? Uh, well, Casey, I haven't any plans particularly. But everyone goes to see somebody over a Labor Day weekend. Everybody. Oh, I know, Ethelbert. I'm waiting for them. You mean everybody will come to see you? Ha! Uh, excellent deduction, Casey. Yeah, but why should the whole world be the path to your door? Why? I work for Anchor Hawking, the most famous name in glass. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Tony Marvin. Every week at this time, the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation of Lancaster, Ohio, and its more than 10,000 employees bring you another adventure of Casey, crime photographer, ace cameraman who covers the crime news of a great city. Written by Alonzo Dean Cole, our adventure for tonight, Hideout. Night. A street of old houses, unpainted, unkempt, dirty-looking houses. A man and woman hurry along the street, watchful, furtive. In a shadowed doorway of one of the houses, they halt, and the man knocks quickly and softly. From inside the door... <laughs> Who's there? The guy who phoned you an hour ago, Ed Bagley's pal. Okay. I'll open up. Be quick about it. I'm being quick. Hey, by the rods. Just want to be sure who you are, mister. You've come to the right house. My name's Bliss. You guys call me Creepy. Uh, you fit the description I got. Get inside, Doris. Okay. Close that door quick. And lock it, Creepy. You don't have to tell me my business. Oh. So you're tough Luke Davis. And wife. Yeah. Nice clean getaway you pulled at the heist of that bank for a hundred grand, according to what I read in the papers. If the getaway had been clean, we'd have been out of this town by now, not here. <laughs> Don't worry. Old Creepy will hide you out. Got a nice room upstairs for you. I hope it's better than what I see down here and what I smell. Yeah. Don't you ever open a window? Neighbors and cops might see and hear things through open windows. Besides, I don't like drafts. They're bad from a cough. Come on, I'll take you upstairs. Come on, Doris. What a jump. You don't like it, sister? You don't have to stay. Hey. You two are traveling light. Nothing but that little satchel for both of you. Did you expect us to show up here with a couple of trunks after what you read in the papers? No, but the hundred G's you got from that bank should make quite a bundle. Have a big suitcase, maybe. I'm wondering if you lost. We didn't lose it. Uh, you got a hit away, huh? Well hit. Yeah. Uh, sure you brought enough dough with you to pay my rates? You'll get yours. Where's this room you got? Yeah, I'm tired climbing. Here's the room. Oh, look, it's worse than those crummy ones downstairs. Yeah, it stinks. Got a good, strong door on it and heavy bolts. Also, it's an easy jump from that window onto the next roof. But more important, old Creepy's never bothered by the cops. They don't know he runs a hideout. They think he's just a poor, sick old man. Well, the joint looks safe, Doris. Anyway, we're stuck with it till the heat dies down. How much, Creepy? A thousand bucks a week. What? You lousy robber. Two guys were killed in that bank holdup. Two Davises are wanted for murder. Okay. Grand a week. Payable in advance. Give it to the rat, Luke. Take it, G. It ails us extra. What? Of course, you can go out to the restaurant if you want to take the chance. How much for meals? Well, it depends on how expensive your tastes are. <coughs> Folks with 100 G's stashed away will naturally want the best. Yeah, we get it. But be careful, Creepy. I'm a guy who explodes under pressure. <laughs> Don't put it on too hard. Two weeks 
in this crummy joint, Luke. Of course, it's nearly 4,000 bucks. Yeah. 25 bucks a piece for the lousy horse meat he calls steaks, two bucks a bottle for beer that costs him two for a quarter, and a dollar for a five cent newspaper. I'm fed up. So am I. Most of all, I'm fed up with this dirty, stinking room. Oh, what's the use? We're stuck, and we've got to make the best. I'm not so sure of that. Huh? I've been thinking, babe. So what? Hand me that nail file, will you? So you could get a decent manicure. Not with the manicures. What's on your mind? Hand me the nail file, I said. Okay. Okay. Here. Now, will you? I'm have... thinking about us leaving here. For where? Another hideout. We don't know any others in this town. We don't stand a chance of getting out of town yet. I just remembered what another con told me when I was in stir. There's a guy who runs a big hideout racket here, Doris, and he treats Red Hot's right. Why didn't we go to him in the first place? I tell you, I just remembered his name. I'm going to get hold of him on the phone downstairs and make arrangements. He'll send a right car to pick us up. He'll do everything. Then this rat creepy sees himself losing the dough we've been dishing out, and he tips off the cops. He'll figure who this other hideout guy is, Lou. Creepy he'll... won't have any chance to figure it. You mean... Ah. Uh, my nails ain't bad, but I wish I could get a real manicure. You'd be sure about asking for I'll say he has. Right, coming upstairs and bringing that hoochie water. Yeah. He's going to make us a present of it. No noisy shoot. Of course not. Open up, Davis. I brought your whiskey. Okay, creepy. Come in, Mr. Bliss. Oh, thanks. Good stuff I got you. One of the best blends on the market. You owe me a hundred bucks for the bottle. No, Creepy, that bottle's on the house. What do you mean? Hey, hey, fire that gun. I'm bending this gat over your head. Oh, don't. Chiseling rat, you lousy chiseling rat. Let him have it plenty, Luke. He's had it plenty. Be sure he's finished. We don't want him talking. He'll never talk to anyone again. Go through his clothes and find the dough we paid out to him. I'll go downstairs to his phone and make a deal for a real hideout. You better open a window down there and let in some fresh air. Yeah. I'll be glad to get out of this smelly place. Our story will continue in just a moment. The time has come, the sponsor says, to talk of beer and ale. For brewery taste and purity. For goodness without fail. Use glass to keep the flavor right. For glass will never fail. That's it. Glass and glass alone brings you beer and ale as it ought to taste. Right. Glass bottles and glass bottles only can bring you beer and ale as it comes from the brewery, unaffected by any foreign taste or flavor. And now we have a new kind of bottle. The Anchor Glass One-Way Bottle. It requires no deposit. No return to the store. When it's empty, dispose of it as you would any food container. It saves space in the ice box. It's unnatural for picnics. Easy to open, easy to drink from. It's always in good taste. And it protects that real brewery flavor. As only glass can protect it. Yes. The revolutionary new Anchor Glass one-way no-deposit bottle is sweeping America. For perfect flavor, demand beer in glass bottles. For extra convenience, demand your favorite brand in the new Anchor Glass one-way no-deposit bottle, a product of Anchor Hawking. The most famous name in glass. The body of this character, Creepy Bliss, was found this morning because a cop was very observant, Miss Williams. I'd like you to mention that in your paper. Well, don't I always put in a good word for you cops, Captain Logan? Well, I have the opportunity. Yeah, the trouble is, Logan, you guys give us so few opportunities. That comedy, Casey, is strictly Joe Miller. <laughs> <laughs> okay, pal. But well, what did your observant cop observe? And a downstairs window was open. Bliss never opened one, summer or winter. Oh, that's why this joint smells like a glue factory. Yeah. Well, the cop was familiar with Bliss's habits, investigated the open window, and found Bliss with his head bashed in. Mm. Otherwise, the murder might have gone undiscovered for weeks. When was his head bashed in? About 10 o'clock last night. The idea who did the bashing? We're sure Luke Davis did it. Davis? You mean the bandit who held up the bank two weeks ago? Uh-huh. He and his mom, Doris, had obviously been hiding out here. They found their fingerprints all over the room where Bliss was beaten to death. Well, then Bliss ran a hideout, eh? That's the picture, Casey. 
He ran it pretty smart. The cops never had him under suspicion. He ran it so smart that apparently the gang in control of the hideout racket here wasn't wise to him. He wasn't a member of the gang. No, I don't think so. Hmm. I've heard just one guy bosses the hideouts in this town. That's my dope in the situation. Well, you've never been able to learn much about the hideout boss. Have you, Logan? No, he's the toughest of all racketeers to find out about, Miss Williams, because he's the one crook other crooks don't squeal on. Yeah, for the very good reason, Annie, that every crook figures that he himself will need a hideout eventually. And he wants to be on good terms with the guys who can provide it. Yeah. Now, Luke Davis and his girlfriend probably made a connection with the big hideout operator before they left here last night. Luke left some fingerprints on the telephone. Well, there's no way of tracing the call he made. Miss Williams, only amateur detectives in crime fiction can trace local calls when a phone isn't tapped. The phone companies can't do it, and neither can we poor professional cops. Mm-hmm. So Luke Davis and his wife have made another getaway. Yeah. And we probably won't catch up with them until they figure it's safe to come out of hiding and try to blow town. Well, if they could be found right away, it'd be front page stuff. And big. I'm so sorry I can't oblige you two with something immediate. You've found nothing that might be a possible lead to where the Davises went from here. Another thing. Oh, you know you can tell us about holdouts, Captain. We keep them strictly off the record. I'm not holding out anything on you, Miss Williams. You've heard all I've learned about this thing. Of course, you've been in touch with Barney Rubin, huh? Oh, sure. I got nothing from him. Well, now, who's Barney Rubin? Well, Annie, altogether off the record. He runs a joint on the west side called Barney's Bar. It's a crook hangout, and when Barney hears interesting things, he passes them along to Logan and a few other guys that he trusts. Ah, a stool pigeon. Well, more a undercover guy, I'd say. Barney never's been a crook himself. Uh, that we know of. I don't know. I've always figured him on the level, pal. Well, he's been very helpful at times. Well, if he's not a crook himself, how come crooks trust well, him? Well, Barney's man? brother, you see, Annie, was a big-time racketeer, and he and his mob used Barney's bar as a hangout. The brother was cut in two by machine gun slugs in one of those sweet gang double crossings five or six years ago, and well, Barney turned very sour on all gunmen. Outwardly, though, he remained on good terms with the cookies that he'd met through his brother's connections, but on the QT, he's done him a lot of harm. Now, this is strictly off the record, Miss Williams, and you forget you heard it. Sure, Captain Logan. Well, let's get back to the paper, Casey. We've got everything here there is to get. Yeah. See you later, Logan. Okay. So long, Captain. So long, Miss Williams. Well, Annie, I'll drop you off the office. Leave these pictures I took with Tate in my department. Oh, where are you going? Well, Nailing Davis and his mall will make a big yarn, Annie, if it breaks soon. So, before some other newspaper mug gets the idea, I'm going to see Barney and make a deal for an exclusive tip if he hears some interesting information. Casey, I ain't heard a word about Luke Davis and his mall, and I don't expect to hear any. Them Red Hots is from out of town, you know, when the mobs around here ain't acquainted with them. Yeah, well, uh, what I'm asking you, Barney, is this, see? Mm -hmm. If you hear anything, let me have it first, see? A at the same time that you pass it to the cops, I mean, before other newspapers can get it. You know, I always return the favors that you do me. <laughs> sure, sure, I know. Yeah, I might have been bumped off a couple of times if you hadn't persuaded uh, certain wrong G's that uh, I wasn't a student. Yeah. <laughs> I give you tips and you do me favors. That's right. Well, do we play it that way again? Why not? But like I say, I can't hope for a thing on them two Davis Red Hots. <laughs> Sound too promising, Casey. Oh, he'll tip me if he hears anything, Annie. Guy in his spot needs guys like me to front for him sometimes. Again. Well, I'd hate to be in his spot. Running with crooks and hunting with cops is playing the hard way. Yeah, I'll see. A Annie, mm -hmm. here comes Ethelbert. We can't talk about Barney, even to him. Hello, Casey. Hello, Miss Williams. Hi, pal. Evening, Ethelbert. <laughs> Excuse me, I was busy up at the other end of the bar. Night, <laughs> well, uh... What's, uh, what's no, Casey? Uh, Casey and I have been working on that hideout murder. I've been reading about it. The cops are sure Luke Davis and his wife did the job. Huh? Yeah, it's open and shut. Why do you suppose they killed the guy who'd been hiding them out? Well, those hideout rats are always greedy, Ethelbert. My hunch is that Creepy Bliss piled up the charges until Davis got sore and worked him over. 
From what I hear about Davis, he always got sore when he was overcharged. A waiter I know who comes from the same town as Davis was in a while ago, and he was telling me about him. Huh? Well, a few people in this town know Davis. What did he tell you? Only what I've said, that the guy added up his tab very careful and made a big squawk if the charge was a dime or so too much. This guy knew Davis well. I'd kind of like to talk to him. Yeah, he might give us some angle, Casey. Well, he didn't know Davis well, just waited on him occasionally. Anyway, I don't know where you could find this waiter. He's only a acquaintance. I don't even know his last name. Oh, you know. Mm. Well, the thought. Say, slip his pack of cigarettes, will you, Edward? Okay. This waiter said Davis had a very annoying habit, aside from adding up a check too careful. He ruined menus. What? Ruined menus? Yeah. Seems he's a bug on keeping his nails manicured, and they was always razor sharp. He'd run one of them nails over the menu to mark each item he wanted, and he'd cut the paper almost clear through so the menu couldn't be used again for other customers. Mm. Oh, interesting, but unhelpful. Yeah. Well, how about those cigarettes, huh? Oh, gee, I almost forgot. Here, Casey. Thanks, Pop. Uh, Thanks. Uh, this way, they said Davis ruined phone books the same way. But phone books? Yeah, underline the numbers he was going to call. As Annie. Casey. Uh, his nails was also hard on tablecloths hey, and Annie, napkins. Hey, uh, where are you going? Back to Creepy Bliss's joint. You've given us a tip, pal. I... And thanks a million. Oh, that's all right. I... What'd I do? <laughs> Hey, maybe Ethelbert's given you and Miss Williams something, Casey. There's a notation on Davis's police record about his sharply manicured nails. Uh, and you're sure he made a call from here last night to arrange for a new hideout? Huh? Oh, yeah, we found fresh prints of his on the phone. But where's the phone book, Captain Logan? On the table beside the phone. His prints are on the book, well, too. Let's go through that book. All right, now. Ethelbert's waiter friend said that Davis's nails cut almost through the paper where he underlined things, Captain. So his mark should be easy to spot. I'll find it if it's here. I'm taking the book page by page. All right, well, now, ripple through it first. We may save time that way. Let's see. Allen, Amherst, Austin. All right, the A's. Now the B's. Abbott, Bacon, Baker, Sandiger. Uh, Logan, wait a minute. Hmm? There it is, Logan. Ah, deep nail mark under a name and number. Look at that name and number, Casey. Holy! Wait, it's Barney's Bar. But... Barney. But both of you told me that this Barney was in with the cop. Yeah, looks like we were wrong, Miss Williams. Yeah, plenty. Sergeant, take this book and go over it page by page. If you find any other marks like this, let me know. Yes, sir. I don't think you'll find any more, Logan. Yeah, neither do I. Playing ball with you cops, as it seemed, gave Barney a nice cover-up, didn't it? And we fell for it because now and then he did give us the real lowdown on wanted crooks. Logan, thinking back, those crooks never had any dough when Barney turned them in. Well, he took all they had for hiding them, and then... Yeah, he... then put them on the spot, Annie. Sometimes collecting a cash reward for doing it in addition to the goodwill of saps like Logan and yours truly. Yeah. We went out of our way to protect the rats, to keep better rats from getting wise to them. How are you going to handle them, pal? I know how I'd like to handle them. Well, I'd love to see you do it just that way, but... Yeah, sure. That nail mark's no evidence, and if I bring Barney in for questioning, I, I tip my hand. Squirm out from under. And not only that, the Davises might be warned and get away. Say, Logan, Barney might be persuaded to uh, lead us to the Davises, and at the same time cook himself. Oh, Barney's smart and careful. He lets the little guys do his contact work. Yeah, maybe not with Red Hots who've gotten away with a hundred grand. I think Barney takes a deep personal interest in that kind of moolah. Uh, you figure the Davises are carrying that dough with them? No, I doubt it. Experienced crooks like the Davises don't trust other crooks. They know they're at the mercy of a hideout proprietor. Uh, I think they managed to bury the dough somewhere. That may turn the trick. I don't get you. No, neither do I. Hideout landlords are greedy guys, Annie. A hundred grand is a lot of dough, and there's no honor Can among thieves. talk straight. All right, how's this? I'm going to call on Barney. I've done him favors in exchange for tips he's given me, all right? Tonight, I'll hand him a tip and hope he does me the favor of falling for it. Does that straighten up? Casey! Got the double talk. Go on, pals. <laughs> I didn't expect to see you again today, Casey. Well, I just, uh, 
dropped in on a chance you might have something for me, Barney. Uh, not a thing, fella. I told you there wasn't much hope I'd get the load down on them babyses. Yeah. Well, I thought maybe, you know. <clears throat> I, uh, I got a little new dope on them after I left you this afternoon. Yeah? Yeah, this is uh, strictly confidential, Barney. I, I could only spill it to a guy who's aces with the cops, you know. Well, uh, you know how I stand with them. Yeah, sure. Uh, what's your dope? Uh, not that it'll mean anything to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, Captain Logan tipped me that he has definite proof that the Davises are hiding out with all of that hundred grand on them. On them? Yeah. Didn't have time to stash it away before they went to creepy blisses, Joyce. Um, hundred grand is a lot of dough. Must fill a big suitcase, huh? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it might. But, but a lot of folding money can be carried in a guy's clothes, Barney, and a lot more under a woman's dress. That's so. Look, keep this way under the hat, Barney. If the cookie they're hiding out with knew that that dough was right under his nose, <laughs> well, you can figure it easy. Yeah. Them uh, Davises would be in a real bad spot if the hideout operator knew. That's right. Fortunately, of course, nobody knows except you and me and a few cops. Yep, that's the way it is. Well, I'll be running along, Barney. Uh, maybe you'll have something for me tomorrow. I'll drop in. Yeah, you, you, you might be lucky, Casey. I might have something about them Davises. Yeah. Well, good night, fella. Good night. Barney's getting into his car, Logan. Uh, he's never been known to leave that joint of his until 4 a.m. closing time before. Oh, this is midnight yet. Looks like Casey's scheme is working. Yeah. Well, he sure had me over a barrel. He said that that dough should fill a suitcase. We don't even know whether Davis has any baggage with him at all. His car's starting. Follow him, Sergeant, and don't lose him. Okay, Captain. Now, Casey, we'll find out if your tip to Barney pulls a pail. Hey, Barney's car is pulling into that public garage, Casey. Yeah, I see it, Eddie. Uh, we followed the guy for half an hour, and all he's been heading for is the garage where he puts his jalopy to bed. Barney lives only a few blocks from here, Casey. Maybe, maybe he got wise. We were tailing him, Logan. He didn't get wise. Our driver knows his business. All I do now, Captain. I'll drive out past the garage and park where we can keep an eye on him. Okay, sir. If Barney comes out, Martin here will follow him home and keep a watch on him. Even though Casey's big scheme is flopped, I don't want Barney out of sight for a minute. Well, look, he's out of sight right now, pal. Huh? Yeah, the big doors of that garage are wide open. When we pass it just now, I, I saw think... Barney go through a door in the back. Yeah, that's what I saw. Stop the car, Sergeant. Yes, sir. You'll find out where that door in the back leads to. Can't lead outside, Logan. The garage is built against a ledge of solid rock. No, and it has two stories, Casey. There may be rooms in that second story, a hideout. You see any attendants in the garage? Only one guy. If this is a hideout, he'll be working for Barney. And all of you stay here. I'll go in and stop him from giving any signals. I'll go with you. You stay you. here. Huh? More than one guy goes in, the lookout might get wise and pull a fast one before right. he stop. That's right. Okay, you're right, pal. We'll stay behind and watch. Good evening, friend. What do you want? I'm having a little motor trouble. My, my car is outside. You take a look at it. This is just a storage garage, mister. We don't do mechanical... I want to find out what kind of work is done here. It's what I call a very sweet, fast job of quieting your guy. Open your flat on me, Casey. Take care of this log, Martin, and keep him quiet. Sergeant, post the men so no one can get out of this building. I'm going to see what's behind that back door. Yes, and this time I'm coming along. I need to. Well, there's no time to argue. Come on, but be quiet. Oh, the door's not locked. Barney was depending on that lookout. The stairs going up. With the door at the top. Well, let's go. What do you mean? What do you mean? That's the only no. reason I came up here. That's what I'm trying to tell you, but Why? you don't want no attention. Hey, that's Barney's I didn't listen. want to take any chances, so I, I dropped in to see if you and your missus was comfortable, Davis. Davis! Comfortable. I've been in cells that were bigger than this lousy room. Coffins is much smaller than this room. Nobody's going to put Luke and me in coffins, Barney, not for a long while. Yeah, it'd be too bad if somebody did, Mrs. Davis. You, too, ain't got so much to live for. Not much. <laughs> a hundred grand. 
But it's going to be too bad. Hey, why not, Jack? Got a silencer on it, Luke. Have the door, Casey. Together. <laughs> Drop that gun, Barney. No. If you wanted that. Oh, got him, Captain. Don't reach for your gun, Davis. I got that, Copper. I'll only reach for this. Dave, <laughs> Annie. He's got this William. In front of me, Copper, and I also got my gun. Now we'll shoot it out on terms I like. Oh, yeah? Look out, Luke. <laughs> You dopes always watch the guy with a gat and forget about the guy who hasn't any, Davis. This will teach you to remember. Oh, Casey. Uh, that's what I call a very sweet, fast job of quieting a guy, Casey. You flatter me, Lawton. We'll join the crowd at the Blue Note in just a moment. On these hot afternoons and evenings... One of the most agreeable sounds is the tinkling of ice cubes in a big frosty pitcher and the promise of refreshing ice-cold lemonade, iced tea, or delicious fruit juices. Mmm, how good it tastes. And how wonderful it looks when poured from the new Sunburst Crystal Pitcher. Now, the Sunburst Crystal Pitcher is a radiantly beautiful two-quart pitcher in the magnificent new kind of crystal the whole country is talking about and admiring. Why, it picks up light like a diamond and scatters it in a thousand flashing rays. And here's the surprise. You can own one of these magnificent, sparkling, sunburst crystal pitchers for only 50 cents. Yes, only 50 cents, or slightly more in distant cities. So look for it tomorrow in the windows and on the counters of the retail stores of America. Sunburst Crystal is a product of Anchor Hawking. The most famous name... In black. Good night, Ethelbert. Oh. oh. Oh, good night, Grace. Oh, say, you forgot your umbrella. Oh, well. Hello, Ethelbert. Oh, hello, Casey, <laughs> Miss Williams. <laughs> Nice day, ain't it? Nice? What do you mean, nice? It's pouring. Oh, Ethelbert, does Grace always affect you that way? Who? Oh. <laughs> uh, not to change the subject, your paper said that hideout case is all cleared up. Oh, if you read it in the Morning Express, it's true. Yeah, the cops even found the hundred grand bank load. On the Davises, where Casey told Barney it was. Yeah, that was when I thought I was pulling a fast one. <laughs> Oh, Ethelbert. <laughs> Look who came in the door. Oh, Grace. Walter, bring the mop. Prime Photographer, starring Stotts Cotsworth as Casey, is brought to you each Thursday by the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation, makers of Fire King Oven Glass. Anchor Glass Containers, Anchor Caps and Closures. All products of Anchor Hawking, the most famous name in glass. by John Beats. The original music is by Archie Blyer, and the program features Miss Jan Minor as Anne and John Gibson as Ethelbert. Herman Citizen is the Blue Note Pianist. This is Tony Marvin saying good night for the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation of Lancaster, Ohio, with offices in all principal cities of the United States and Canada. Thursday night on CBS is the biggest show in town. So stay tuned for exciting dramatizations on Reader's Digest Radio Edition, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is CBS Columbia, broadcasting system.